So you take a transaction and make it an interaction. Your frontline delivers your bottom line. The moment of truth in your organization happens right there. Every time it gets challenging, this is such a great learning opportunity. Welcome to another episode of Better Business, Better Life. I'm your host, Deborah Chantry-Taylor, and I'm passionate about helping entrepreneurs lead their ideal lives by creating better businesses. I'm a certified EOS implementer, an FBA-accredited family business advisor, and a business owner myself with several business interests. I work with established business owners and their leadership teams to help them live their ideal entrepreneurial life using EOS, the Entrepreneurial Operating System. My guests come onto the show to authentically share the highs and lows of creating a successful business and how they turn things around in their business to create a better business and a better life. Or, as in today's show, they are experts who specialize in working with established businesses. Today's guest is fabulous. She was born and raised in Lyon, France. She was recruited to set up the retail arm for Disneyland Paris in 1992 and then later went on to work for the Disney Institute. She met her husband, also a Disney executive, in a laundromat in Orlando and they now live in Sydney. Valerie Cockrell is the author of Manage Like a Mother, Leadership Lessons Drawn from the Wisdom of Mum. She is also a consultant who actually works and trains people on some of the Disney magic that she's been involved in, so bringing that magic into your business. Welcome to the show, Valerie. It's lovely to have you here. Thank you, Deborah. Thank you for having me. I'm looking forward to our conversation. Absolutely. We always have a bit of a catch-up before we actually come online, and so I've been learning a little bit about Valerie and and how she got to where she is now. I'm going to let her share her own story. So why don't you tell us a little bit about how you came to be where you are now, Valerie, because you're in Coogee in Sydney, but you're not originally from Coogee, of course. (laughs) No, not at all. And I'm sure people will very quickly pick up on my French accent. So originally from France, born and raised and lived in London for a little bit when I was 17 years old. That's why I learned English. That led me to uh, a job working for Disney. And from Europe, I actually ended up moving to Florida for about a year. I I had a one-year visa, worked at the French Pavilion at Epcot, for those of you out there that have been to Walt Disney World, and then went back to France, started a career in banking for a couple of years. And one morning I got a call from Disney, I said, hey, we're opening a park in Paris. We'd love to hire you. You know Disney, you speak English, you understand American culture. And I, of course, said yes did the opening of Disney in Paris, relocated to Florida, married an American in the process, became American also. And, and then we worked for Disney, the two of us, both of us worked for Disney. Um, I was there for about 16 years. Half of my career was in retail and the other half working for Disney Institute. So for people who are not familiar with Disney Institute, this is the external training arm of the Disney company. A lot of organizations out there want to understand how Disney delivers this level of service when they run an operation that is just gigantic. You have Florida is 55 million visitors and 75,000 employees in one site. So considering the volume, a lot of companies are like, okay, how do you maintain those standards? And this is where Disney Institute, you know, shares part of that expertise with outside organization. Now, the interesting thing is, initially, a lot of companies from the hospitality world or the entertainment world would be intrigued and would want to learn from Disney. But very quickly, we realized that, you know, it's just common sense. It's just very basic things that are delivered with consistency. So a lot of organizations from all kinds of industries would be joining in to learn. And I train many people from different countries, different cultures, different organizations and uh, industries. So that was very fulfilling and interesting. Uh, However, in 2018, we decided to leave Disney with my husband. Fantastic organization, but it's also a 365-day operation. And that can take a toll on you and on your family. So we were ready for something else. And we decided to start our own business, which is a bit of of a jump. But we relocated to Colorado 
and started our own consulting firm. We did that for about six years. And six years into it, my husband got an opportunity to run an organization here in Australia. And uh, we decided, why not, at a time of our life where most people will stop thinking about retirement, we're like, hey, we empty nesters, the kids are scattered all over the place. So why not try it and go and discover a new part of the world, a new culture? And it's been, you know, fantastic. We've loved it. We moved to Koji last March. So it's all very recent. I'm still learning a lot. And I finally know where to do my grocery shopping. So, you know, as a French person, I got my priorities straight. But we love that. We love it here. It's been great. Perfect. And somewhere in amongst all that, of course, you had children, but then you also wrote an amazing book, right? But I have that book here, Manage Like a Mother. So tell me where that book idea came from and how you got to write that. Well, I think most people, you know, as you get to the, I will say the twilight of my career, you start reflecting back on what you've learned. And I actually happened to grow up with my mom, who's now 92 years old. I've heard her all my life say, I wish I was 20 and I knew what I know now. And I, I've heard this so many times, Deborah, that I would roll my eyes every time she would said it. But now I feel the same way. I wish I was 20 and I knew what I know now. So it kind of, you know, ignited something in me thinking, well, maybe I can take what I've learned and share it with younger women, younger leaders, and help them maybe uh, avoid some of the, the hard lessons I've had, I've had to learn and maybe help them in their journey. Because at the end of the day, you know, as you age, that's what you want to do. You want to help people. You want to leave a mark. You want to help them do better. You do that for your kids, but I think you do that with your friends and the people that surround you. And if you can make a difference in one person's life, it's extremely fulfilling. So that was, that was the motivation for it. Now, the topic itself came to me because over the course of my career, I had to, several times I stopped working either because we were relocating from France to the U.S. or because my kids were very young. We have three children. So I wanted to dedicate myself to them for a little bit. And every time I went back to work, I, like most women, had said, not second thoughts, but more uh, I was doubting my ability to take on leadership responsibilities again. I was thinking maybe my skills are outdated. Maybe I'm not, you know, I don't know how to do this anymore. And in the process of this reflection, I realized, you know what, what makes a great leader is really not much different than what makes a great mom. And much of the learnings or much of the th many of the things that I was practicing as a mom, I realized could help me be a better leader in the workplace. And once I started digging into this analogy, I thought like, well, it is so obvious. It makes sense, you know? So that's, that's how the book came about. It was a labor of love because it took me about two and a half years to write because, I, you know, I would put it down and then ignore it for a while and then go back. And, but eventually it all came together and the book has 21 chapters. Every chapter is a different competency of leadership. And it, every chapter starts with a story that happens with my children. And then the second half of the chapter is the insights and the learnings that you can extract from that. So I'm, I'm very much leaning to the storytelling first, because I come from, you know, I've worked for Disney many, many years and we, it's a storytelling company. But also I know that with stories, people can relate. They will read the story and say, oh, yes, I experienced that as a kid. Oh, yes, I've experienced that as a parent. And, and then when, when people relate to a story, they retain it. When they retain it, they can implement it. They can learn from it. And then it makes, you know, it gives them a tool and something to, that they can, they can use in their, in their life at work, their personal life or their professional lives. So. One of the reasons I actually love Patrick Lencioni is one of my favorite authors. And I love him because he doesn't necessarily tell true, true life stories, but he tells everything in a story first and then relates the principles of the people management that, that fit in around that story. And you're right, it's so much easier when you can actually relate to something. Oh, yes, I've had that happen or it sticks in your mind for a long, long time. Okay, so 
it is a great book. I've just started reading it. I must confess I have not got through the whole thing yet, but it's certainly it, it's it's great to see that you, you liken, you know, being a mum to, to what it is like to be a leader. But it isn't just for women, is it? Like this, the same principles apply whether you're a man, whether you're a woman. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, you don't have to be a mom. You don't have to be a woman to enjoy this book because we all have one thing in common. We've all been kids and we all remember what it's, uh, what it's like to be a kid. And we remember specifically when we were teenagers, what it was like if our parents, usually it's the mom. And, and by the way, I call the book Manage Like a Mother because the vast majority of us have been raised primarily by our moms. This is changing for the better. And I also know that, you know, dads were, are involved, were involved in their own way. But I think we, we've all been kids and we remember what it feels like when your parents are supportive, yet they, they give you enough space that you can make your decisions. They would empower you. They would let you make mistakes and learn from your mistakes. And you remember the satisfactions that came, that came with that. You also maybe remember when your parents were overbearing, controlling you, maybe not giving you enough independence and the frustrations that, that came with that. So, you know, remember all this good learning, you know, and, and take all of that and, you know, remember that when you engage with people in your organization as a leader and trying to find that right balance of giving them, you know, empowering them and letting them make some mistakes and learn from it and develop them. Uh, there are so many similarities between the two. And I think we, we can, even if you don't have kids, you can just remember those times where you learn, mis you learn things, your parents let you, you know, let you make a mistake and how it felt like that was the end of the world. And then things eventually worked out for you. And, and that's usually how it is. But it's just a good reference. It gives people a good reference. And I have to say, we tend to overcomplicate things. We tend to make things, you know, very complex. And I always feel that it's a lot better and a lot easier to correct course when you go back to basic things. And I know Australians are very much into sports. So I'll give you a sport analogy. I played tennis for many years. I'm not a I'm no champ by any, by any stretch of the imagination, but I played recreational tennis for many years. And whether you play tennis or golf or, you know, whatever, when your shots, are, you know, your game is off, you can't hit your shots, then they're landing where they're supposed to land, you get a little bit frustrated. I've always found that you can recover when you start focusing on taking care of basics. So in tennis, for me, it was like, okay, Valerie, Keep your eyes on the ball, bend your knees, hit your shot, and follow through. These, these are the basic things you, you learn when you, when you start playing tennis. But by doing that for about a game or two, suddenly my game would slowly, gradually come back. And then I could you know, strategize and, and, and improve. And I think in leadership is the same. You know, Sometimes it is overwhelming. It's super complicated. And we, we just don't know. We're like squirrels, right? Well, our head's spinning. We're trying to, we don't know where to go. There's so many things, so many distractions, so many possibilities, so many opinion. And that's where I say, okay, let's go back to basic. Let's focus on, you know, hiring the right people, training them well, treating them well. And when you can do that, then you get about 85%, 90% of your job is covered. And that's the essence of, of work relationship. Simplicity, yeah, it's something we, we tend to overcomplicate things as humans, we, just by nature. So it's really important to sometimes take a break and go back to, as you said, to those absolute basics and make sure you're getting those right. So I, I'm sure there's going to be a lot of people who are listening and kind of thinking, you know, what was it like to work for Disney? Because we all have this image of Disney, and, and certainly it's very well renowned for its amazing customer service, but also we have this vision of everything always being fun and it's all about making people happy. What's been sort of the biggest lesson that you learned in, in working for Disney? Well, listen, I've created a workshop that's called the method to the magic and the magic being the hint to Disney. And I always start my workshop by saying, look, I have bad news for you. There's no magic whatsoever, none whatsoever. It's all about 
processes that allow you to create consistency and also raising the bar so you can connect emotionally with people. So you take a transaction and make it an interaction. And when you can do this, I always joke, and maybe I shouldn't say this so much, but what Disney does so well is they tap into your heart on their way to your wallet, right? And when you build this emotional connection with people, a positive one for that matter, has to be positive, you build loyalty, there's no price resistance. And this is how 55 million people fly to Orlando every year and, and literally surrender their paycheck, right? And say, please take my money away from me because I just love the experience I'm going to have in, in one of your parks. So that's what they do. And how do you create this emotional connection? It's by surprising people. And we all have wants and needs. We want certain things. If you go on vacation to Walt Disney World, you want a vacation, you want to spend some time with your family, you want to be entertained. But there are needs that you may not even articulate yourself. You want to be respected. You want to be treated as, as an individual. You want to be treated as a VIP, made, made me feel special, right? And so as an organization, when you can do this, you elevate the service. You go above and beyond what people want. You know, you deliver the want and you deliver the needs and you surprise them with this. So at Disney, they create what they call magical moments. And those magical moments, are most of them are planned. So we know that in this bakery shop, on the hour, every hour, they're going to pull a little kid from the crowd. They're going to give them a paper hat and let them decorate cookies. And the child's going to go away with his paper hat and a free cookie that they have decorated, uh, like pretend working at Disney kind of thing, and a little certificate. Cost of the operation, a couple of dollars. The impact on that family, you made, you made this kid feel super special. And when the children are happy, mom and dad are happy. And now they have something to talk about. They go back to social media and they say, I went on vacation to Walt Disney World and guess what happened to us? And then they relate to the experience. Because social media, people talk about two things, the really horrible things or the really wonderful things, right? So create you know, moments like this where you can tap people into their emotions and give them this moment of you know, uniqueness that you don't get to experience much, especially when you're in a park with another 60,000 people, right? So they, there are a lot of those magical moments that are already you know, pre-planned and created. But when you do enough of that and you do it for long enough, then it becomes spontaneous. It's contagious. So then you have your, your workforce, the frontline people. That's all they think about is creating those magical moments. And most of these magical moments, a lot are pre-planned, but now there's a lot of spontaneous thing. And that's the beautiful thing. This is when you have a culture where everybody is engaged, everybody is try to create this little moment, this little special moment for the guest. And the guest, you know, they, as we, you know, as they're called at Disney, they're not clients or customers, they're guests. Then they go home and they have this really emotional connection with their experience at Disney and they go back and they recommend the, the company and they come back. Some people come two, three, four times a year and 20 years in the making. And sometimes you're, you're on to the third generation of, you know, within the same family coming to Walt Disney World. So that that's the magic. And it's not magic. It's just processes, you know. I'm so pleased to hear that because part of the work I do as an EOS implementer is about making sure that businesses put processes in place for their for their main, you know, core processes. And people always say, but you know, we don't want to become robots, but it actually has the opposite effect. If you and I think it was Isidore Sharp um, from Four Seasons said you should um, systemize the predictable so you can humanize the potential. And it's like actually you just described that perfectly in a story is that you they have this absolute standard process where they do the cookie every hour, but it actually creates a culture of people wanting to have interactions and engagements rather than transactions. Love it. <laughs> and I have, many, I have many stories like this. I mean, anybody who's worked at Disney could share, you know, incredible stories like this. Well, often very emotional. Actually, I did a, 
presentation not too long ago to a group of Brazilian entrepreneurs, and I uh, was speaking in English and had a translator, and I was relating a story that is, you know, quite sad and emotional. And halfway through, the translator was starting crying. And I looked at the audience and everybody was looking kind of strange. And I'm like, well, what's going on? And everybody suddenly turned towards the translator who was sitting at the back of the room and she was bawling <laughs> trying to translate the story. But it is, you know, it's beautiful. And, and that's how, you know, then it, it comes, it's still very genuine because it, it's just something that people buy into in frontline people. I always say, this is the, that your frontline delivers your bottom line. The moment of truth in your organization happens right there. You can be a great leader. You can have the most incredible vision. You can be an incredible, you know, have an incredible strategy. But at the end of the day, the moment of truth is going to be, you know, your frontline and the ability to deliver your vision. And if it doesn't happen properly there and it's not genuine and it's not consistent, none of that, you know, none of that, nothing matters. So this is where, and, and you look at an organization like Disney, where frankly, Disney doesn't pay well. You know, if, you, if your job is to make hamburgers or clean the park or load the attractions and everything, it's really not exactly financially um, fulfilling work. But people are very loyal to the organization because, yeah, maybe you don't make much money, but let me tell you, you get out of bed in the morning and you're given the opportunity and the tools to make that kind of impact in people's life, you know, boy, you know, that, that's it. You know, people work for three things. They work to pay the bills. We all want to pay the bills, but we want to be part of a team. We want to belong in Disney among many other companies that are very successful. Does that really well, making sure you belong and you realize that you are relevant. You make a difference. So those are the three things. So Disney maybe doesn't pay well or too well, but they make you feel like you belong and it make you feel relevant. And that, that's it. That's the magic. That's perfect. I know that you talked in your book about, you know, building an intentional culture and hiring on, on values and things. Can you tell us a bit more about that? Because, I mean, we talk a lot with our clients around that and often they kind of go, oh, your values, they're very fluffy. What does it really mean? And it's only when you start to understand what impact they actually have, it becomes more relevant. But tell me how Disney goes about hiring the right people. So... The, the thing with Disney and many successful organizations, I think in any case, one of the things that I advocate for is that unless you are hiring engineers or pilots or doctors, in a lot of jobs, you can teach the skills, right? And when it comes to running a register or making a hamburger or doing loading attractions like at Disney or maybe working a front desk or, you know, you can teach the skills. It won't take you too long as an organization to teach your, your, your new hire how to perform properly. Passion is something that people will develop over time because if they get good at doing something, they will feel good about themselves. When they feel good about themselves, they develop a passion for it. The most important thing to me is attitude because attitude is not something you can change, okay? When you have a new hire, a candidate shows up and applies for a job in your organization, they have that luggage with them. This is something that has been imparted to them through their parents, their upbringing, their teachers, you know, the, the people they've been surrounding with. As an organization, it's really hard to change somebody's attitude. So you want to make sure you recruit somebody who has the right attitude. And somebody who has right attitude is somebody who is a problem solver, somebody, somebody who can self-motivate themselves and, and always raise the bar. And when there's an obstacle, they figure out a way and they will learn and acquire new skills and try to overcome problems. And there are some technical ways when you recruit people where you can identify this. And I'll give you a, a quick example. If I were to say, Deborah, thank you for applying for a job in my organization, in our organization, what are the three things, if I were to call your previous employer, what would be the three things you're really good at? And then you would tell me A, B, and C, because you can prepare to answer that question, right? And then my next question would be, all right, Deborah, now if I were to call that same employer, where would he say that you have some areas of opportunities, areas where you need to improve? 
And uh, you may have to think for a little while because usually people don't like to share this, but eventually I would say, you know, take your time and you would give me maybe one or two things. Maybe my technical skills are not good enough. And then my next question should be, so Deborah, since you heard this, what have you done to change that? And that will tell me whether indeed you have the attitude of, okay, first the humility to say, you know, I have a shortcoming, I recognize it, and I'm going to work on it and try to improve so it doesn't, so I get better at it. So when people have, when people will tell you, well, I actually sign up, you know, to do this, or I got online and I tried to learn these skills, improve my skills. Now you're starting to see the right attitude. Somebody who will take on an obstacle or a challenge or one of their shortcoming and try to improve. That's the kind of folks you want working in your organization. To me, that's the focus of when you hire people, these are the kind of people you want to have. Then the other thing is, and you know, when it comes to, to Disney, you have to really be truthful about the job, the expectations, how hard the job is, the intensity of it all. You know, when you interview at Disney, you go to casting, that's why it's called, because you're part of the show, right? To become to become a cast member. And they make it very clear right away what are the non-negotiable. So in terms of appearance guideline, in terms of what you can or cannot do or can or cannot say. But more importantly, they're also being very truthful about this is the environment you're going to work in. And these are our values. You mentioned values. And at Disney, they, they, we retain them with the, the, the word orchid B. It's openness, respect, courage, honesty, integrity, diversity, and balance. So this is how we operate within the organization. Those are the values. And you know, they, we're not going to compromise this. These are never going to change. doesn't matter what crisis we're going through. This is the, these are the values of the company. So you have to be able to align with this. But also when it comes to a more operational thing, let it be known that you're going to work in an environment where it's crowded, it's loud, it's high intensity, it's demanding. You work in Florida, it can be 38 degrees out there plus humidity and you're going to be miserable you know, you have to be prepared, but as you have to be prepared for this, but we as an organization have to be honest about it. And I think often, especially right now, where it's employees markets, you know, people have a lot of options. For employers, sometimes they tend to not be so truthful about a job. And I would discourage you from doing that because, you know, if people get the job with you, you may have them, bring them, spend a lot of time training them, onboarding them, and then they will realize that the reality is not at all what it what they were told it was, and they'll go and find their happiness somewhere else, right? So it, this is something that I think organizations have to remember. Let's not sugarcoat what the job is. Let's be honest and, and, and recruit the right people with the right attitude in the job. So. Yeah, I love it. And I think that's really, really important. I think sometimes, especially if we if we want a candidate, we can. We can actually paint a much rosier picture than what really goes on. But they're going to find out because you know, probably on day, if not the first week, it'll certainly be the second and third week. They're going to realize exactly what it's like. <laughs> and as you said, we invest a lot of time in training people and onboarding them and bringing them up to speed. We want to make sure they really, truly understand the highs and the lows of the, of the role. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. And, I, you know, I always say companies like Disney, I always say it's like a duck. Right. When you go there as a visitor, uh, a duck on the lake looks, everything looks smooth and nice and peaceful. But under the water, there's a lot of paddling. There's a lot of stuff happening. And it's a it's a tough job. It's high energy. And it can be intense. And like I said earlier, it's a 365 day operation. And that can be very demanding. Yeah. And so it was 75,000 people working there. So it's not as if you're um, intimate with every single person that you work with either. And out of those 75,000, so first of all, Walt Disney World Florida is the biggest single site employer in the U.S. So the only thing bigger than that would be uh, a military base. But when it comes to the private world, uh, Walt Disney World is by far the biggest single site employer. And 
And, you know, you have these 55 million people coming and you got to be ready for them. And, you you know, sometimes people say, how do employees keep a smile on their on their face? And we say, we hire smiling people. We hire people that are upbeat and a little bit extrovert. And, and maybe when you go through this interview and we tell you about the values and we tell you about the environment you're going to have to operate in, some people will say, you know, nope, I no can do. And it's okay. It doesn't make you a bad person. It just doesn't make you a right fit for the Disney organization. That's it, you know. We talk about that a lot with clients. It's like at the end of the day, if somebody doesn't sort of fundamentally share your core values in the way that you operate, it doesn't mean they're a bad person. In fact, quite the opposite in some cases. They're just not the right fit for that particular organization. But they will find somebody somewhere else where they feel um, really great in terms of what they do. Yeah, I, ex- I experienced, I wo- you know, I mentioned earlier, I worked for a bank for two years and I thought at the time I was in my early 20s thinking I wanted to be a stockbroker. And I don't know, it, it just appealed to me. I had this fantasy in my head of, of being great in banking. And after two years there, when Disney called and said, we're opening Disney in Paris, would you like to join our organization? And I was, of course I do, of course, because I had realized by then I, that I wasn't a right fit for the banking world. Doesn't make it's the, you know, it's a bad environment. It just means it wasn't the right one for me. And I I would not have been been able to articulate it this way so clearly. But now looking back, that's exactly what it was. I realized I wasn't built to work in the in the banking world. And that's it. Hmm, nothing wrong with that. Okay, I know that when we spoke before the podcast, you're very passionate these days about women and women in leadership and some of the the diversity that that can bring to an organization. Would you mind sharing a bit about your feelings about that and, and what you want people to know? Yeah. This is um, interesting because when I finished the book and, you know, when you write a book, it's, at some point you have to cut the umbilical cord and it's it's painful because as time goes, the more you talk about your book, you think over certain things and you're like, oh, I wish I'd talked about this and mentioned that or extended on this. And one of the area that I find myself getting into now is saying, okay, if we make the argument that women and mothers are uniquely prepared to take on leadership responsibilities because of all these competencies they've they practice as moms, why is it we have so few women in leadership when we actually have parity in the workplace and in the U.S. today, and I'm, I don't know what the numbers are exactly in Australia, but I suspect they're probably very close. You have about 70% leadership roles are held by men. And I would say even 7, 75%, the higher you go, the fewer women you find in the workplace. So why is that? And that's why, you know, in the book, I say, if men read that book and they realize a lot of men, actually, if you ask them, you said, you know, who's, who are the people who have the most influenced your leadership style? A lot of men will say, my mom. <laughs> it's like, okay, so if you understand that women have this uniquely, uh, you know, unique talent to take on leadership responsibility, why don't we have more women in the workplace as leaders? And so it goes through certain things. I think the number one being equal pay, because when you give women equal pay, and right now for a dollar you pay every man, uh, you pay about seventy-five cents, uh, eighty-five cents. Sorry, in the U.S., I think it's seventy cents in Brazil. So there's, I think, Australia fares actually better than than the U.S. I, I want to say it's about ten cents or something like this. But if it's equal pay, uh, equal work, why aren't we given equal pay? Because when you pay women enough, then they can take care of their children, they can p- afford childcare, and then they can go to work and be effective, not having this you know, guilt of, you know, I'm not giving my kids the best experience possible or the best upbringing possible. Or the other way around, I'm staying home with my kids or I'm spending time more investing time in my kids and therefore I cannot do my job, you know, uh, completely or the best way I could because I'm always like, you know, shuffling back and forth between the two and and just often it's because the money is not there to make sure the children have quality childcare so women can dedicate themselves fully to their job. 
and, and be given the flexibility sometimes to go back and, and take care of the kids. There's also, you know, equal pay is one thing, mentorship, giving women the right training, the right opportunity, hiring based on talent, not solely experience. Because if you focus on experience, well, the most experienced leaders are men. So then the problem repeats itself. Your pool of candidates will be, in majority, will be male. And therefore, you have fewer women leaders to tap, you know, to, to, uh, to hire. So, it, you know, all these are basic steps that organization can, can implement to make sure that women are giving a better chance at, at leadership. I'm really interested right now to see, I'm really excited about the upcoming American elections, and I don't want to open a can of worms, but, you know, the idea that possibly a woman could become the president over there and have this, you know, incredible leadership opportunity may move the needle for women, you know, and and provide more appreciation for what they bring to the workplace because it's it's not exactly the you know it's it's not better or worse than what men do and there's a bit of stereotypes in this so I want to make sure I'm I'm not putting everybody in one box right but the vast majority of men are you know more assertive they can you know they have a self confidence that women don't have it is a, a done a known fact that if there is a job opening women will only apply if they have 100% of the criteria that are required. Men will apply if they have 50% of the skills required because they're like, hey, I can wing it or I can learn on the job, right? And I think uh, historically, men have always survived because they are strong and they have power and they, they can rely on their athleticism and their strength to overcome. Women overcome by forming a tribe, forming a group, being on defensive, looking at red flags, analyzing the situations and making sure that they prepare for everything. So, you know, take that centuries later, when you put those two approaches together in the workplace, now you have a winning scenario and, and you have two different perspectives, two different approach. Again, lots of stereotypes here, but generally, this is how women approach leadership and this is how men approach leadership. And if you can combine the two, I think it's, it makes a really interesting, uh, interesting formula. You know, it's interesting. I read not too long ago, there was a study that was done at, I believe it was MIT and Carnegie Mellon, and they were trying to measure the IQ of a group. They, we've always measured the IQ of an individual, but what happens when we put people as a group? So they form three teams, and they gave each, each of them the same assignment. And what they found out is that the first learning was that if you put a lot of really high IQ people together, it doesn't necessarily make that team uh, more productive or smarter. It doesn't, you can't add up everybody's IQ and have this super smart group. The second learning was that if in the group you have one person with a really high IQ, but this person hijacked the conversation and the decision-making process, the performance of the group actually goes down. And the third learning, which was really unexpected, and they were not even trying to investigate that, but they realized that the performance of the group goes up pretty uh, drastically when there are more women in the group. Why? Because women, based you know, what I was just saying is they, they're more, they're used to collaborating, they listen better, they read the room better, they're more open to constructive criticism. And as a result, it made the group more productive and got a, a better performance from that group. So it was something that they stumbled upon. But I think once again, that it's about bringing variety, different perspective, different approach. And now you get a team that that is that performs better in general. So those are the things that, you know, none of that is in the book, but I've kind of, after writing the book, I'm like, okay, if women have all these competencies built in, 
why not leverage that in the workplace? And that's where I try to make the case for more women in, in leadership positions. Yeah, and I think, I mean, I've always been a, a big advocate for diversity. I, I was on a lot of boards and a lot of women on boards. And it wasn't about having quotas and things, but if we can just have more diversity across the range, right, whether it be around the sexes, around the, their backgrounds, their experience, it means that everybody in that group will actually be better because of it. So it, I, it's, a, it's, a good, yeah, it's a good thing. Okay, look, I'm sure we could talk for hours, but unfortunately we don't have hours to talk. So, And I always like to ask the, the, the guests to give our listeners three kind of tips or tools that they could actually take away and apply in their life outside of this. What can you share with me, Valerie? So I'll tell you what, um, I'm going to go back a little bit in time. But, you know, like I said, in 2018, we started our consulting business with my husband. And in 2020, of course, COVID happened. So every single engagement we had scheduled got canceled. And it forced us to, you know, think out of the box. As we say in the US, life gives you lemons. You have to make lemonade, right? So we developed a college course and we also developed a course for realtors that they can use. So it's kind of bringing the Disney magic to your real estate world or, you know, all of this. And what I learned through the process is, you know, crisis can be a real opportunity. And if anything, working as self, self-employers it's a bit dangerous, it's a bit scary, it's a bit, a bit daunting, but every time it gets challenging, this is such a great learning opportunity. And I found that was it, when you're an entrepreneur, you are going, going to be going through that, this roller coaster. There's going to be great days, there's going to be bad days. The thing is, unlike in the corporate world, there are no safety, safety nets, no, no, nobody's here to support you and encourage you. So it's something you have to start doing by yourself. And when I look back at my career, I realized that every time things were uncomfortable and were challenging, this is where I learned the most. So one of the things that uh, I share, and I mentioned we created a course for college students and we worked with several um, universities in the U.S. that had hospitality programs. And one of the things I tell college, so you asked me about two, three things, but I'll give you four. And I usually tell, I usually tell students, I say, okay, you want to be the best you can be. So think about best and you take those four letters. The first one, the B stands for be yourself. Run your own race. Stop comparing yourself to others. Social media is just garbage. You know, tons of people out there look fabulous on paper or on social media. And then just outside the frame, there's, there are divorces, failures, miserable people, anxiety, depression, burnout, and all of this. So you don't, know, you don't know what the others, just be yourself. Everybody else is already taken, right? Uh, so that's the first one. The E stands for experience and exposure. Get experience, get exposure. Say yes. Try it. You never know. You may end up stumbling on something that you develop a passion for and that you really enjoy. We made our three kids, when they were 16, work in horticulture at Disney, which meant that during July and August, they had to get up and be at work from 6 a.m. to 2 p.m., weeding and mulching when it's about, you know, 38 degree weather with 95% humidity. It's a miserable job. And I remember my daughter saying, Mom, why do we do this? You know, this is hard. This is, I got stung by uh, bees and this and that. And I said, you know what, Margot, one day you will realize what a great experience it was. And some years later, she went and applied for a job and the, the um, talent acquisition team was like, you worked for Disney, what was that like? And she explained what she had been doing. And I said, wow, you actually got up at 5 a.m. and showed up at work at 6 a.m. every day in this kind of circumstances. It actually says something about you. And that's when she realized that, yeah, I learned to be resilient, to be reliable, show up, be on time, you know, all of this. So any exposure, any experience you can gain is valuable. And then the S stands for skills. Always upgrade your skills. Things are changing fast. Technology moves way faster now than our ability to keep up. So you got to learn. You got to update your skills all the time. And then T is for try. Try it. Try again. Fail, fail again. You know, but fail better is the, the saying. And 
like I said, like I said, you know, crisis, I always say crisis is a mysterious opportunity. I think it's a Japanese saying somewhere in there, there is a nugget of learning and something that will help you later on. And it is uncomfortable. I went through that as a kid when I moved to London with my five words of English and I could say, my name is Valérie, I'm French. And that was it. But, and it was really uncomfortable and miserable. But you know what? That I learned English. That's how I got the job with Disney. That's how eventually, you know, at some point I, I um, managed to go from France and relocated to the U.S. When I, that's how I worked from retail. And then eventually when I went back for Disney, I worked for Disney Institute to do public speaking. This is not something I had ever envisioned that I would do. And it wasn't comfortable the first couple of times. And then you slightly get better and then you get to enjoy it. Uh, today, this is how I moved from the U.S. to Australia. It is not easy to put everything, you know, in a container and hope for the best. And, oh, let's go to the other end of the world and see what, what's going on there. Don't be afraid of change. Try things. You will learn tremendously in the process. You, you will build resilience and you will meet people from all over the place that have different perspective, different opinion, and you will learn. And the more you go out there and stick your neck out and see what's out there, the more you realize you don't know much. <laughs> and, and it's a journey. There's no destination. It never ends. So that's it. Those are my four things. Best. If you want to be your best, do all of that. Do all those things. That's wonderful. And as you said, crisis can be an opportunity. I think it's really true. It's funny. I have a reverse experience. So I'm actually from the UK. Grew up in the UK and I actually got dumped in France when I was 13 years old by my parents to sort of go and learn French. And we had learned a little bit of French at school, but it was pretty average. You know, you don't really learn real French when you're there. I spent six weeks there. I came back speaking fluently. It was awful in the beginning, but now I have lifelong friends that I go back and visit. So it's, it's all good. Perfect. Well, I just re remind me of a couple of other things that you said. So best is obviously one of the important things. I love the fact that you talk about going from transaction to interaction. That's really important. That's how you create experiences. That's what people remember. And I guess the, the key one that I actually wrote down is the front line delivers your bottom line. So your people who are there at the front line are the ones that can make or break the business. So absolutely fascinating. I've loved learning more about Disney. We actually use Disney as an example in our EOS teaching. And so it's really nice to actually hear from somebody in the organization here that what we talk about is, is, is happening in there. So that's fantastic. Your book, I'm going to finish reading it now. So Manage Like a Mother, I'm going to put the link to that in the um, actual podcast. And as you said, it's, it's full of stories, which is how we all tend to learn. So Valerie, I just want to say thank you so much for your time. I really appreciate it. And I look forward to remaining in contact. Might even see you in Coogee one day. Wonderful. Thanks, Deborah. Thanks for having me. Thank you very much.